Alright, for the past couple of weeks I've been doing an internal medicine elective rotation and I've had the opportunity to hang around with students and see EKGs with them. And this has made me realize that EKG interpretation is one of those things that medical students really struggle with. That's why in this video I'm going to give you the three rules of thumb that made me go from being a student who panics when is given an EKG to someone who feels pretty comfortable interpreting almost any EKG. And so the first tip and probably the most important one is to make sense of the EKG as much as possible. You see, EKGs are one of those few things in medicine where almost every finding has an explanation that actually makes sense. And yet, time and time again, I see students trying to learn EKGs via memorization of criteria rather than logical thinking. And well, I really shouldn't blame the students. After all, this is what many EKG books invite you to do. For instance, the book that almost everyone at my medical school used to learn EKG, which by the way is literally translated as the joy of reading EKGs, had a section where they discussed ventricular hypertrophy, and the few paragraphs dedicated to it focused entirely on electrocardiographic criteria. Now, there is nothing wrong with learning criteria, but if in your head LVH equals this, well, no wonder why you struggle with EKGs. You're making it harder than it needs to be. Because again, by just pausing and thinking for a couple of minutes, you can make all of those criteria actually make sense. All you need to do is take a step back and go through a few basic points. For example, regarding LVH, think about the following points. First, electrodes show positive tracings when an electrical impulse is directed towards them and a negative tracing where the impulse is directed away from them. Second, the heart is normally skewed with the apex towards the left side. Third, this is the normal position of the electrodes. Fourth, the left ventricle is normally bigger than the right ventricle, which means that the net sum of electrical impulse is directed towards these electrodes and away from these other ones. By taking all of this into account, it should make total sense that the more lateral electrodes show more positive tracings, while the more anterior electrodes show more negative tracings. And if you understand that, you can make sense of criteria such as an R wave bigger in V6 than in V5. And by that same logic, you could also figure out, for example, the morphology for right ventricular hypertrophy that would invert the normal pattern because, well, the impulse is not now going more anteriorly towards these kind of leads. And so even if you forget the specific criteria, you can always arrive at how the EKG should look by taking a step back and thinking. That's precisely the reason for why even after taking a whole year away from going to the clinic for studying for the USMLE, I can still grab whatever EKG I'm shown and analyze it without breaking a sweat. Because again, I've made the active effort since day one to learn EKGs by making sense of them, not by memorizing a bunch of criteria. And yes, I'd say you can make sense of about 95 to 99% of the findings you'll find on the EKG. So yeah, that's the rule, not the exception. Now, the second rule of thumb is to first learn the normal EKG by heart. Or in other words, the most important EKG you should know is the normal EKG. And everybody thinks, yeah, yeah, I know the normal EKG. But that's not usually the case. To make you aware of that, I invite you to grab a blank piece of paper and draw the normal appearance of all of the waves in each lead. If you end up drawing these in every single lead, it means you really don't know the normal EKG well enough. By knowing the normal EKG, I literally mean that you should know how the P should look in every lead. In which leads should it be positive? In which ones can it be negative? In which ones can it have a biphasic component? How big should it be? How deep should the Q waves be? Where should you see QRS complexes with a predominantly positive component? Where with a predominantly negative component? How elevated can the ST segment be in normal conditions and in which leads is higher than others? You should know the answer to all of those questions and all of those details. You should have a really crystal clear image of the normal EKG inside of your head. Because if you know what's normal, identifying the abnormal becomes second nature. Okay, and finally, our last rule of thumb to master EKGs is to analyze one thing at a time. Because when you're first starting out, a complex EKG can be quite intimidating. You see a bunch of stuff going on everywhere. And your first instinct is to say, wow, that's just too much. So the solution for that is to use a system that makes you focus on one thing at a time. So forget about all that mess and just answer a specific question such as, 
Is there a positive P wave in lead 2? Is there a negative P wave in lead AVR? If yes, great, you've just answered that the P axis is normal and therefore you know that the rhythm is coming from the sinus node. Now you move on to answer other specific questions that will tell you all that other stuff you should know, one thing at a time. Now, I developed a system to do precisely this in a systematic manner. It has a mnemonic that makes sense in Spanish, which is REFEOS, which literally translates very ugly, so it's easy to remember in Spanish at least. And the point of this mnemonic is to make you analyze the subcomponents one by one of the ECG. First the rhythm, then the frequency, then the axis, then the waves, then the segments and intervals. And you literally just focus on one thing at a time. In the waves, for example, you go lead by lead analyzing if there are P waves and if they are normal. Then the Qs, then the R, then the S, then the T, wave by wave, lead by lead. Once you're done with that, you should have a list of findings some normal, some abnormal. And well, now it's just a matter of coming up with explanations for each one of those findings. For example, let's say you find some high voltages in the precordial leads, particularly very deep S waves in V2 and V3 and high R waves in V5 to V6. Well, you already know how to explain those findings with the stuff, with the stuff we said a few minutes ago. It is the classical image of an LVH. So you just need to learn how to do the same thing with every other finding you can come across. And I know that at first that sounds like this impossible feat to do, but believe me, it just takes a little bit of time, especially at the beginning. But once you get in the group of things, you realize it's not that hard. You really just have to know the common patterns, understand them really well, and then you have your ways with the EKGs. And well, the upside is that there are awesome resources to help you with that. We ourselves have a few videos on the topic on my Spanish YouTube channel and we will be posting a detailed paid course on the matter in the upcoming weeks. But if you don't want to pay or if you don't know Spanish, well, there are tons of other awesome resources as well. For example, the Strong Medicine YouTube channel has a whole playlist teaching you how to interpret ECGs. All of those videos are free and believe me, they are way better than most of the EKG books I've tried to read. But in any case, that's really all I have for this video. Let me know which topic should I cover in the next episode. But for now, thanks for tuning in. As always, I'll see you guys in the next video.